From London Bridge Station, we followed the map to reach Borough High Street and then we walked up St. Thomas Street. This area has long been associated with medical institutions. The oldest St. Thomas Hospital which was founded in the early 12th century. It was connected to the priory of St. Mary Overy, which once stood by. St. Thomas Hospital survived the closing of the priory during Henry VIII's dissolution of the 1530s. But in the 19th century, it was forced to leave the area to make way for the development of London Bridge Station. Guy's Hospital, the second major hospital associated with this area, was founded in 1721 and is still based here. It was named after Sir Thomas Guy, a local-born printer and publisher who made a fortune investing in the South Sea Company before the famous bubble burst. Much of the South Sea Company's revenues came from slave trading, so this indirectly funded the creation of Guy's Hospital. The original purpose of Guy's was to accept patients that St. Thomas Hospital had already decided were incurable. Going back to the old operating theater, this attic of the church was originally used as an apothecary of St. Thomas Hospital and housed medicinal herbs. In 1815, part of the roof was converted into an operating theater where female patients of St. Thomas Hospital were operated upon without anesthetic under the gaze of a large audience of med medical students. Horrific as this sounds, it was certainly an improvement on the previous arrangement under which operations were performed within the ward itself and in front of fellow patients. The theater remained in use until 1862, when it was bricked up and forgotten about, after St. Thomas Hospital moved away from Southwark. The rooms were rediscovered in 1956 and carefully restored, the result being the country's only surviving 19th century operating theater. Just before we reached the church, was a small public park where Charles Dickens' father was imprisoned for failing to pay a debt of 10 pounds. Many of his works were directly influenced by the experience, particularly Little Dorit, in which the heroine is born inside Marshall Sea. This prison was notorious amongst Londoners for its terrible conditions. Opposite the church, we followed the map along Marshall Sea Road, where on the right is a plaque recalling that this was once the site of Suffolk Place, the London home of the Dukes of Suffolk during the 15th and 16th centuries. Henry VIII set up a mint here and was notorious in Georgian and Victorian London as a dangerous slum or rookery and we found this Catholic church. We crossed over and continued north up Red Cross Way, where just on the right-hand side is the site 
of Crossbones Graveyard, one of the strangest places in London. For many centuries, Southwark was infamous for its brothels near the Thames, many licensed by the bishops of Winchester, who were the major landowners in the area. The prostitutes, nicknamed the Winchester Geese, had to pay part of their earnings in rent and fines to the bishops of Winchester. However, despite having added to the church's income, when they died, they were not able to receive a normal burial because of their lowly status and instead were interred here on unconsecrated ground. John Stowe described the place as being where single women were forbidden the rites of the church so long as they continued the sinful life and were excluded from Christian burial if they were not reconciled before their death. And therefore, there was a plot of ground called the single woman's churchyard appointed for them far from the parish church. Just opposite the graveyard is an isolated and atmospheric bar called the Boot and Flogger. It is the only premises in the country allowed to sell wine without a license, a privilege awarded to certain free venters dating from Elizabethan times. The pub's name refers to a corking device in which a leather boot holds the bottle whilst the wooden flogger flogs in the cork. Today, the graveyard belongs to Transport for London and there is no public access. However, the local people have created a unique shrine at the gates celebrating the outcast dead attaching hundreds of ribbons and trinkets to remember those unfortunate enough to have warranted burial here. We continued north and just on the left at the junction is the Mint and Gospel Lighthouse. This offered basic education facilities in many of London's 19th century slums. We continued north under one of the many railway bridges that snaked their way around the area and cross hop exchange. Southern had close connections with the brewing industry from the 17th century until the 20th century and the exchange was opened in 1867. The hops bought and sold there were a crop that had originally been introduced into England from the Netherlands and were added to beer to give a distinctive bitter taste and act as a preservative. Working-class Cockney families would often travel down to Kent to get seasonal work in the hop fields. Head back and continued north where you can see the courage sign on the wall, which is one of the few remaining physical reminders of the breweries that were once based here. And just before we reach the entrance to the borough market, we might recognize some of the buildings which was used as the backdrop for a number of scenes in Guy Ritchie's film, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels in 1998. Barrow Market is arguably the most atmospheric in London and is the capital's oldest fruit and vegetable market with its origins in the 13th century. 
when Southwark Fair was held just south of London Bridge. Thank you. 